для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm standing in the fields at Kursk. The largest armored battle in history took place here in July of 1943. Hitler planned to annihilate the Soviet army at Kursk and make one final effort to win the war in the east. Here, thousands of tanks, both Soviet and German, clashed in a battle of monumental size. Kursk was one of the most significant single engagements of the 20th century. After the Nazis' defeat in this battle, Hitler's tanks, the pride of his army, would never again regain the strength which had carried them from the English Channel to the Volga. And never again would the Germans meet the Russians on even terms. After Kursk, Hitler's ability to launch a major offensive was severely curtailed. Our story, the world's greatest tank battle. In the spring of 1943, the Red Army readied itself for its summer campaign. In particular, it prepared for an offensive from its salient at Kursk. The winter had ended with a great Soviet victory, the capture of an entire German army at Stalingrad. After Stalingrad, the initiative lay with the Red Army. Humiliated by his defeat, Hitler hungered for revenge. He would bite off the Kursk salient at its base and annihilate the Russian armies within it. He called it Operation Citadel. On April 15, 1943, Hitler called for a victory that would shine out like a signal beacon to the world. And Nazi Germany responded with solemn vows. Reinforcements poured toward the east as if from an inexhaustible well, train after train. With slave labor from all over conquered Europe, German arms production had increased. In 
1943, aircraft production was one and a half times what it had been the year before. Double the number of tanks came off the assembly lines. There were new models, high-powered, heavier gunned, more thickly armored. Panther Mark Vs and Tiger Mark IVs, the best that Germany could produce. Grounds, they seemed invincible. Nothing, it seemed, could withstand their advance. The Wehrmacht began to mess. Hitler's Operation Citadel called for 20 divisions to the north of the salient. 28 to the south, and seven at the salient's tip. 16 of them were armor divisions. The Russians watched the Nazis concentrate, counting. 900,000 men. 2,700 tanks, 10,000 guns, 2,000 planes. In the Kremlin, the Soviet high command considered the options. The choice was between striking first or letting the Nazis attack and then reply. Stalin decided to let the Germans throw themselves on the Russian guns. Soviet divisions in the salient were to set up box defenses with as many as seven or eight defense lines, echelon a hundred miles deep. When the Nazis had exhausted themselves, the Red Army would attack. Stalin appointed Marshals Zhukov and Vasilevsky to oversee the operation. By 1943, Soviet industry had more than overcome the setbacks of the early part of the war. Though half its capacity had been lost at the outset, it was now outproducing Hitler's Reich. Deep behind the Urals, the mills operated day and night, forging steel for the Red Army's tanks and shells. Aircraft production and tank production became a torrent. These were no longer weapons for the defensive. They were the means of carrying the war into Germany. They gave the Red Army preponderance in what was to become the greatest armored conflict in the entire history of warfare. The numbers were ominous.
three months, half a million freight cars rolled into Kursk. The Soviets crammed 10 field armies into the salient, plus two tank armies and two air fleets. 1,300,000 men, nearly 20,000 guns and mortars, over 3,600 tanks. Five more field armies, a tank army, and an air fleet were in reserve. Marshal Zhukov arrived to supervise the preparations. The salient was 100 miles wide at its base and 75 miles deep, pointing west. On the central front was Marshal Rokossovsky. Marshal Vatutin commanded the Voronezh front. Marshal Konyev held the general reserve. They were ready. They expected the Nazi attack somewhere between July 3rd and July 6th. Von Manstein, commander of the German army group south, had not been enthusiastic about Hitler's plan. He suspected that the Soviet strength might be too great to overcome. Himmler arrived to inspect the pride of the SS, three divisions of them. The Liebstandard, das Reich, and the Totenkopf, the Death's Head the purely Germanic SS. They were about to enter their last and fiercest battle. On the eve of the battle, Hitler announced, soldiers of the Reich, you are to take part in an offensive of such importance, the whole future of the war may depend on its outcome. More than anything else, your victory will show the world that the resistance to the power of the German army is hopeless. Other messages went home to Germany. Father, the world looking at us should stand with bated breath. We're ready to fight. The justification of the war is that Germany will gain vital space. It is for this that we are ready, if necessary, to burn the whole world to ashes. Inside the salient, too, the mail came and went. Letters home. But to homes that no longer existed. To villages that had been put to the torch. To mothers, fathers, children, wives, living a nightmare. Or already dead. occupied lands, the soldiers' kin were fighting their long battle as partisans. All across the upper Donetsk Valley, the green fields of wheat were turning yellow under a gentle westerly breeze. But the sense of peace was illusory. Thank you. 
The Soviet units had been briefed and rehearsed. All around their perimeter, they had sown mines to a density of 4,000 to every mile. Special tank destroyer squads were waiting for the panzers in foxholes in the middle of the minefields. The minefields themselves were designed to channel the German armor onto Russian anti-tank guns, massed in groups and firing broadsides at successive targets. Thousands of Russian guns were zeroed in. Over 900 Katusha rocket launchers were loaded. The troops were confident. Two of the field armies were veterans of Stalingrad. On the field of Kursk, as June ended, there were the makings of Armageddon. Two and a quarter million men. Over 6,000 tanks. 29,000 guns and mortars. All silent, waiting. some casual shooting disturbing the quiet. A few snipers dueling to relieve the tension. During the night of July 4th, a Soviet patrol brought in a prisoner. He said that the German troops had been given a special issue of schnapps and rations for five days. H hour was next morning. North of the salient, the 4th Panzer Army stood, the most powerful force ever put under a single command in the German army. Nine Panzer divisions on a front of only 30 miles. If this enormous strength did not break the Soviets, nothing ever would possibility that it might not produce a strange fatalism in the waiting Nazis. Marshal Vatutin passed the word. It was a colossal battle of attrition. What mattered was not land, but the annihilation of men and machines. Whoever could hand out the most punishment would win. Before dawn, the Nazis began to suffer. 
the artillery strike had caught them in their concentration areas. In the afternoon of July 5th, the Germans launched their first wave, some 2,000 tanks. Their firepower and mobility were even greater than during the early blitzkriegs. Greater still was the Soviet power. One Nazi crewman reported, it seemed as if he were driving into a ring of flame. Many of the Nazi tanks founded in the minefields in the first half mile. The Russian batteries picked them off in minutes. It was carnage of a kind not seen since the terrible battles of the First World War. tank commander said, we had been warned to expect resistance. Never have I received such an overwhelming impression of Russian strength and numbers as on that day. Porsche Tigers and Ferdinands broke through in isolated groups. The new Panther tanks were less successful. Everywhere they were hounded by the Soviet infantry. The Nazis exercised local superiority in the air. But everywhere over the battlefield, their strength was contested. The Luftwaffe was not allowed to become a decisive factor. At the end of the first ferocious day, the Germans had lost 25,000 men and 200 tanks on the northern edge of the salient. And they were still mired in the first line of Soviet defenses. The second line was stronger still.
the southern flank of the salient, where the 48th Panzer Corps and the three SS armored divisions were attacking, the fighting was even fiercer. The spearhead managed to dent the Russian line, the only action that was anything like a success. Under intense fire, the SS were forced to spend the night in the swamp. The sun rose at four o'clock on the second day of the battle, and with it came the Russian fighters. They destroyed 70 of one Panzer Division's tanks in 20 minutes. Through the second day, the Germans struggled to exploit their modest success in the south. Two of the SS divisions clawed their way forward nearly four miles. The battle raged for a week. The Nazis poured in reinforcements. By the night of July 11, they had driven a bulge 15 miles wide and nine miles deep into Vatutin's front. That night, Zhukov released his reserves, the 5th Guards Army, and the Rodmistrov's 5th Guards Armored Force. They were fresh, confident, experienced. And their ammunition bays were full. Germans scraped together every tank that would run, some 600 of them, and began their last drive. The main Russian battle tank, the T-34, faced heavier equipment. Tigers and Panthers. But while the German tanks outgunned the Russians, they were slower, and the Panthers could be set afire with ease through their lighter engine armor. The T-34s were faster, more maneuverable, and more numerous. Through the hot morning of July 12th, the two armies closed for the most terrible armored encounter of all time, a brutal slugging match in clouds of stifling dust and oily smoke. Just before noon, they met head on. Nightfall was over. More than half of the German tanks had been annihilated. The rest were in full retreat. 
Stalingrad had been a psychological victory. Kursk was an undeniable triumph of Soviet arms and generalship. It had been, as Marshal Konyev put it, the swan song of the German armored force. field marshals to cancel Operation Citadel. The Allies had landed in Sicily and Hitler needed reinforcements for Italy. But in fact, Operation Citadel had already canceled itself. Operation Kutuzov the Soviet counteroffensive was underway. divisions pulled back from the shambles, harried constantly by the Soviet pursuit. The Red Army rolled out of the salient towards Orel. But since, Volhov and Hotinets were liberated. It was hard fighting. Though their armor had been used up, the German infantrymen were mostly young, healthy, and stubborn. Very few of them were ready to surrender. Now the Nazis understood the nature of the Russian soldier. A German general wrote, he is immune to the most incredible hardships and does not even appear to notice them. He seems equally indifferent to bombs and shells. Drawing from the relentless Soviet pressure, the Germans destroyed everything behind them. They burned food stocks, raised farms and killed cattle, sowed the fields with mines, blew up the railroads.
Red Army rode forward into a wasteland. Their homeland. The area had been under German occupation for two years. It had been stripped of everything of value. Its people violated. Those who survived showed their gratitude with what treasures they had left. Perhaps the war was over for them. But peace would begin with nothing but memories. army broke into Orel in the early hours of August 5th. One of the first vehicles to enter was an armored car mounting a loudspeaker. It echoed over the street fighting. The song was the blue kerchief about a soldier carrying his lover's blue scarf into battle as a talisman. population of 114,000 when the Germans arrived. When they left, only 40,000 remained. Thousands had joined the partisans in the forest. Hundreds had died of starvation. And as many as 12,000 had been shot or hanged in the public square. From the trenches outside the Orel jail, they unearthed 5,000 bodies. There was little enough to give the soldiers. Perhaps 
perhaps a few moments of peace before they marched away. A little gentleness. August 23rd, Operation Kutuzov reached its final objective. Marshal Konyev's men stormed into Kharkov, far to the south of the Kursk salient. In 50 days, the Red Army had inflicted on the Wehrmacht the loss of a half a million men, 1,500 tanks, 3,000 guns, more than 3,700 aircraft. They were losses that could never be replaced. Cost of Kurs Gorel, the Red Army sealed Hitler's fate, and with Hitler's, Germany's. It had done more than annihilate machines and men. It put an end to the Nazi dream of a thousand-year Reich. yet wakened to the nightmare. In the summer of 1943, the war was still letters from the front. Food and wine. Kursk was the first Soviet feat of arms to be marked by a victory salute in Moscow on Stalin's orders.
20 salvos from 120 guns. 20 salvos to signify that Kursk had proven that Russia could win the great patriotic war, the unknown war. would be heavy. The Soviets had been profligate with blood to buy the peace. President Roosevelt called Kursk the most decisive battle of the moment. He added, we ought to be grateful to this country that can also be a good neighbor and a devoted friend in the world of the future. Give me your hand across the fields so we can build a better world find me a place where we can be brother to brother give me your hand across the field Next story, War in the Arctic. The convoy run through the Arctic seas, the sailors called a death alley, was the most dangerous in the world. Along it came American tanks and guns that helped supply the Red Army's fight in the icy mountains of the furthest north. It was the loneliest battle in the unknown war. 